So now let me introduce you all our next speaker, Dr. Mario Gula. He has graduated in 1973 as an aircraft technician and helped building the first composite glider in Latin America. The same year he obtained his bachelor's degree. In 1974, Mr. Golab moved to Israel and graduated as an aeronautical engineering and technician, Israel Institute of Technology. In the early 1980s, he moved to the USA and worked at the NASA. In 1987, Mario received his master's degree in international management from Thunderbird and then worked as a director for Latin America for Seagate Technology and later as a vice president at Record.com. In 1997, after 10 years in various upper management positions, Mario returned to the educational clusters to obtain his Doctor of Jurisprudence degree and simultaneously a Master's in Intellectual Property. After gaining experience at a top U.S. law firm, Mario founded Golab Intellectual Property to offer his combined 40 years experience in engineering, international business, management and law. He is frequently called to lecture by World Intellectual Property Organization before various universities and government and also by many other organizations. He is registered patent attorney before USPTO and is admitted to litigate at the highest courts of Florida and the USA. He is a member of Florida Bar and various IP association. So I will now request him to present his thoughts with us. Okay. From the fruits of the creative mind, we have tools to protect creative ideas through copyright, uh, practical ideas that are new and not obvious through patents, uh, commercial identity through trademarks, and also the most original of all, and you can see the fourth fruit there, is a uh, trade secret. That's why you don't see it's a secret. Um, basically, we started initially the philosophy we were a communal type of sharing of knowledge as we developed agriculture until pretty much 500 years ago we we shared knowledge amongst ourselves and we took the knowledge of others and incorporated for our own use without paying much attention as to whom it belonged the first written uh, uh, expression that ideas belong to somebody else uh, were expressed in, uh, in, uh, in the question whether something that is a product of the mind could be actual property. Uh, the 10th century, uh, that's what I found that uh, the canon of Jewish law called the Talmud said that uh, the theft of ideas was more than the theft of money. That means it gave, uh, you're required to give attribution to somebody else's thoughts. And that's the first symbol of that. But it was not until, uh, until the, the invention of the printing press that, um, that a, a major revolution took place. Now, why the printing press was such a big revolution? Remember that before the printing press, uh, the books, the authors, uh, only require a scribe to put it together and, and, and draft it. And it may take six months to a year to produce a single book. Uh, to what today would be costing tens of thousands of dollars. And uh, Gutenberg's invention uh, pretty much took away with that, and he could actually take a book by somebody else without any attribution and sell it for a smaller price and made it in, in large quantity. So at uh, the beginning, uh, the, the, the question was who, not who owned that book, uh, because it was clear that whoever had the capital to buy it was the owner, is the question is, was it important to have an author? Uh, in a few years later, just um, 24 years later, the Venetian Republic saw that as a society, it would behoove them to grant some special rights to inventors. Uh, in particular, those who had the, the crystal, the famous Murano crystal. But also because at that time, the Venetian Republic was one of the few places in the Western uh, uh, world that was in contact with the Orient. And they were bringing a lot of inventions from the Orient and they were registering there in, in, in the Venetian Republic. In uh, the, the pendulum swung the other way and uh, the, the printing press 
industry grew up tremendously. And in 1662 in, in England, they decided that the author was not important, that the society would benefit by having those with capital to print books, printing as much as they wanted. This uh, statue only lasted for two years, and the pendulum swung again in 1710 with the statue of Anne, which actually gave back to the authors the, the, the right that was uh, discussed back in the 10th century in the Talmud. Finally, in, 18, uh, in 1787, the Constitution of the United States clearly specified that this was a uh, society right, and it was actually owned uh, initially by authors and inventors. But that societal right was limited in time. And that's the reason we have time limits in copyright and trademark and, and in, uh, in patents. So why does it matter to whom it belongs? It's very simple. If, if, um, if, if there's three possible um, owners of this. Could be society, so we make uh, we can have incentives to to create intellectual property. Could be the owners, or could be the capital who invests on the uh, on the on the development. Now, if you have capital, and that you throw that uh, resources, whether are physical or human resources, it doesn't matter how much capital you throw at that; it, nothing will grow. However, if you have human capital, the capital could assist that in developing, uh, in developing, and so society as a whole will advance. Intellectual property is relevant because it could be exploited for profit. Uh, you can have a nice painting with a, with a patent title, you know, ownership or, or authorship of copyright, but the true value of that for, both for society that enjoys the creation and for the owners is because it could be exploited for profit. The capital by itself does not create intellectual property. And that's what I was mentioning before. Okay, so the society gains when uh, there's, a, there's an incentive given to the author or uh, to be to a signee to create more and more IP. And that's the reason we, today we live in this marvelous world with incredible advancements in medicine, in, in, in pretty much in all, in all areas of endeavor of the human mind. Now, the question that begs right now is, what is intelligence? Well, if we look at a human intelligence, it's very simple. It's a person with the ability to acquire and apply, apply, apply knowledge. But if, if it's so simple, the word person, you can say, well, what about if it's a dog? Can a dog have the ability to acquire and apply knowledge? And for most of us who have dogs, we know that, that that is possible too. So is that sufficient definition? Well, then we'll add something else. Well, the capacity for logic, understanding, self-awareness, learning, emotional reasoning, planning, creativity, all this type of abilities that we today associate with, with the problem solving. But is that all? Well, we have also the ability for empathy. That means help, be concerned, love, care, and have principles and morals, but also the capacity to deceive, cajole, lie, emote, kanji, and all the bad things. Now, for those who had the fortune to have watched uh, Stanley Kubrick's masterpiece, 2001 uh, Space Odyssey, you may remember that there's a, the movie is about a computer called Hall and an astronaut that goes to space and how the computer kills the other passengers and tries to kill this other, the, the last one. And how it is the ability of the human to cajole uh, the computer into getting in. And, and who can survive longest, knowing that the computer will survive an eternity so long it has power. So this was one of the things, but, there, this was a, a fantasy. Now, you may remember that just last year, Boeing had a problem with a, one of these airplanes, the 737-800 MAX, that, uh, um, that the computer system, pretty much artificial intelligence, that was supposedly designed to avoid uh, uh, patterns of flight for the airplane, actually kill uh, the people in two airplanes. Okay, that was the problem of artificial intelligence. Well, the computer itself didn't have malice, but that's what happened. On the other hand, 
there was another flight from Egypt Air that took off from New York, and a pilot who wanted to actually commit suicide, he just dove the plane into the ocean. So as you can see, the intelligence could be used for good or for bad. The question is who programmed Now all this are human characteristics that uh, machines cannot replicate today, but someday they will. Now, now let's go to the other area, what's artificial intelligence? And this is just a system that performs tasks required from human intelligence. And we can see that, for example, today, today self-driving cars uh, require visual perception to see who's in front. But at the same time, a car, uh, doesn't matter how sophisticated it is, if it needs to make a decision, for example, car is driving and it's driving at high speed and one of the passengers doesn't have the seat belt uh, plugged in. So the computer knows that there's a passenger that doesn't have the seat, uh, the seat belt plugged in. In front, there's three people. On the right, an elderly person. On the center, a pregnant woman. On the left, a young child. And the, the car has to brake very quickly and it has to make a decision. That is a moral decision. Who are you going to kill? The passenger, the pregnant woman, the elderly man, or the young child? And those are the type of decisions that eventually intelligence, artificial intelligence, will have to deal with because humans will have to deal with that as well. Any system that perceives an environment that takes this action to maximize the chances of achieving its goal. Now, these are logic goals, okay, that could be programmed in artificial intelligence. Now, creativity is not a random act. Creativity requires uh, the, um, the, the, the human mind or something that could be programmed to create something specifically. But if you use a computer, the computer becomes just a, a tool, a tool to create, like we use a brush or you use a piano to create music. In this case, you, can, you use a computer processor uh, to, to do some creation. However, in the one case, you use intelligence. In the second, you use instruction. Are they the same? The instruction will have to be very precise in order to, uh, to create, to have some creativity. But the results, in one, in the one case, you have a creative work. In the other, I argue, you have a product. You don't have anything creative. Giving the same input, the machine produces always the same output. And that is a product. So it doesn't matter if it's a numerical control machine, or you test it, or how much you educate, the machine produces a product. Now, where are we standing right now? Because the world has changed so dramatically. Since the introduction of computers in the, in the, in the, the 50s, uh, pretty much our world was a binary, uh, was ones and zero. And computers incremented their power uh, as we could, could increment the capacity of processors to process binary instruction. Now we enter in a completely different world where computers are producing using quantum technology. Now, briefly, what is quantum technology? It's the probability that something is closing to one or to zero. So you have two parameters, the parameter of the position of the electron and the, the probability that is closer to one or another extreme. And that, uh, it's a quantum leap, I'm sorry using the same word, but it's a tremendous leap of uh, processing compared to, to binary computers. Now, why this is important? because until pretty much 100 years ago, data was manageable. I mean, you could have an amount, a large amount of people making calculations like the Russians did to get to space to, to, to Mars, and you can do it without computers. Today, it's pretty much impossible. Even uh, right now, we are in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. All, pretty much all this research requires managing tremendous amount of data for so many countries to be able to get to some conclusion. And that is done through computers. Is that in an invention? That was a question. So the question right now is who owns the creation? According to law, we discussed pre previously, the invention is pretty much owned by the author. The question who is the author? Is the machine? 
is the programmer or the implementer? Is the architect the author? Or is the employer as in me? Well, in the US, the, Dr. Ho uh, explained it's very simple. The author, though the, the inventor, is the is the is the creator, but an employer as he needs could be the owner of that creation. A machine cannot be uh, an owner, and a, an, a programmer or implementer uh, it, it doesn't have the the quality of the invention, so it cannot be an owner either. The question sometimes: uh, Computers can do marvelous things, but they can do they can do terrible things. Who is responsible? Who's liable? Because can you sue a machine? If you grant ownership to a machine, can you sue a machine? Can a machine be responsible for the action? I beg to say, no. Who owns the machine? Perhaps. Would the author be responsible? Well, the author may have given instructions to the machine and the machine may have created something that is way beyond the instruction as a, uh, as a co combination of many factors that were input into that machine. So it could be that the results of the machine were not what the author uh, anticipated. So at that point, who is responsible? Is the machine responsible or is the author responsible? Or is the owner responsible? And that's something that will have to be determined uh, in, in law. Uh, this is an interesting concept. I was talking to my wife, she's a neuroscientist, and she says that a person with high intelligence, with poor judgment, pathological, egocentricity, capacity, incapacity for love, lack of remorse, that lack of any human trait is a psychopath. That's the type of person. I realize that the artificial intelligence machine has exactly the same characteristics because it's only based on logic. It has no empathy. Now, what do we have today as available protection for intellectual property, for artificial intelligence? Well, basically industrial and trade secrets. If you have uh, an algorithm, like a lempel ziv algorithm, today you protect it to trade secret and you license that. That's a compression algorithm for, for video and other things. Okay, so we can keep doing that, except that um, uh, uh, trade secret could be reverse engineered and that's a problem. Now, should we give copyright to the author or architect? And the question to that is, is the product of the instructions or the conceptual idea only implemented by the artificial intelligence machine or is the result not contemplated by the author or architect? Okay, so can we get copyright just only to the ideas of the author or architect? If not, we cannot give copyright to the, to the machine. Finally, we can give a patent, but the question again, who invented? Was the inventor avail himself or herself to a computer to develop uh, a new product and invent a new thing? Or uh, was the machine having a result that were not anticipated previously by the, by the inventor? What all suggests is, and this is a proposal, that we will have to develop some sweet generous protection for intellectual for, for artificial intelligence. It has not been contemplated, but we have to figure out whether who's responsible, who's liable, who's the inventor, obviously not a machine, but which party in the process will do that. Because artificial intelligence, as the numbers were shown before my, my previous colleagues, previously by my colleagues, are, uh, they are increasing tremendously. It, it, it is applied in pretty much everything, so ubiquitous. The car has it, the, the refrigerator has it, uh, appliances in general. Uh, you, you get to, to a voicemail and have artificial intelligence to recognize your voice. There's so many areas where artificial intelligence works and it will be embedded more and more and more into every product that we use that um, those countries who will have the right le re legislation will encourage the creation of, of artificial intelligence. So it is very important to understand that perhaps what we have is not suitable. And we will need to have some unique, some sui generis uh, intellectual property.
if the results of an uh, artificial intelligence machine are not a product and if they are unique, then we have to have some protection. If they are you, if, if they are repetitive, then you have a product. It's like having a numerical control machine. You put the material there, comes out the same way all the time. Okay, but. When you program something and there's some randomness or there's some acquired information that can make a machine take a different decision and come out with a result that is unique and is not uh, it's unforeseen, then you're talking that the machine has done something. And that is the type of thing that we need. So in this case, the author would be the owner of the, what I believe would be the owner of the artificial intelligence machine would be the owner of the intellectual property and the responsible for everything. So in conclusion, the area of, uh, of artificial intelligence and how to protect it is very, 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 very important. As countries rush for control to this area, we have to have uh, legislation developed that contemplate this as a unique thing like we do for plants, like we did in this um, for, um, uh, VLSI design by chip design, mass, and for different areas that require specific legislation. And we will require the specific legislation for intellectual property. Thank you very much for your time and for letting me uh, share with you my thoughts.